I know that there's a really important reason for writing. Otherwise, I simply would have, wouldn't have got to where I am now. I wouldn't have bothered. Um, but I, I don't know what it is, and I also don't know whether I need to know what it is. Um, but yeah, it's a constant search. I don't really think I'm, I was trying to like find a voice. I was trying to work out what I thought about stuff more. So I like to write how I think. For me, it's never been about a, a, a love for words when it comes to writing poetry. It's always been like, there's something I want to say and, and that's the best way I can get it out. Like I said, I came from an environment where all the ideas that were being projected to me about where I was from was from people expressing it through, through art, you know? So, I, so that's the only way, naturally, I, I, I learned to express ideas. Me being on a stage, like me wearing a hijab, me being a Muslim girl, me being a Somali girl, that means a lot. Just being on a stage means a lot for people who don't ever imagine themselves taking up space in that way or having a voice in that way. Poetry as a whole is a fantastic medium uh, to be able to kind of work out and respond to the world, to be able to articulate it, to respond to it, to make sense of it, and to give something back to a people that a lot of the time are searching for the same thing as what you are. I would say finding your voice is um, a journey. It's a never-ending journey. You need to challenge yourself to come out of your comfort zone and um, what you're really looking for is yourself. It's like it's like in anything. You're, you're actually looking for yourself. Definitely think is is very much a voice of frustration. I think if you look at the early days of hip hop, even when you look at artists who've been tagged as like gangster rappers, NWA was very much a protest movement. You know, what I mean, their hip hop, although it was very aggressive, it was a protest against the violence that was going on in the inner city LA. Because as a generation, we're so much more connected. We're not just, it's not just restricted to inner city LA or inner city New York or London, whatever now, it's, it's restricted to inner YouTube, you get what I'm saying? So this is kind of like our platform to voice our frustration, you know? This is the art form which people listen to because it's like, it feels like we've exhausted all the other art forms and they're, they're the heritage of a previous generation. So now in our generation, we're trying to find our voice and our process machine, which is also expressive and it's artistic so we can connect with it. And I think spoken word does serve as that tool which really allows us to, to, to connect on, on that platform. I think what's important to say, the thing about spoken word is that you cut your teeth. It's not even rapping actually, like when this all began, you're speaking to people. Like um, you go out into a cipher or you go out into an open mic or into a slam or whatever and you're communicating. This is all about not just doing your art in a vacuum, it's about like making a connection with whoever is in, is in the room with you. When I was 16, I did a, a little talent show or a showcase. I used to rap and um, I went there with one of my friends who also rapped. And he did his, he did his performance, I did mine but the mic cut out in my performance. It kept cutting in and out. I remember just putting the microphone down and just talking the rest of my, my song. It was called School of Hard Knocks. It was about how I grew up. But um, I remember saying to him, oh, that's a lot like poetry. And he kind of laughed it off. Years later, when I became more and more frustrated with the limits of rap, I just, I'd, I'd never forgotten what I learned that night. And when you talk to people directly, Poetry. Impossible is a word people use to describe something they can't do. Sometimes they might want to be sadistic, sprinkle it with a dash of realistic, and say it's near enough impossible, nigh impossible. They'd like you to think you'll lie in hospital for defying obstacles and trying not to fall, but their impossible isn't my impossible. There are no winners until someone's won it. You won't know what I'm capable of until I've done it. I could either stand here patient and listen, wanting to make an incision, having to wait for permission, or I could make an incision. I could take a position. Impossible is the manifestation of your inhibition. So fear of trying is fear of flying. Your mind's racing and your heart isn't out to help. They're turning against you and you're starting to doubt yourself. The nights were cold, the mornings were rough. Now you're worrying about people calling your bluff, second guessing your ability and all of your stuff, but no, you alone is more than enough. This is the truth I saw before I went to sleep. I knew my time would come eventually, so I celebrate every test ever sent to me, because what's about to be 
was meant to be. It's remarkable to try, but I can't afford to die, knowing my ambition didn't kill me. Forget the voice of reason, listen to the real me. No guts, no glory. I think the first poem I ever wrote that I read to anyone, naturally, was for a girl. And <laughs> thinking back, it's really cringe, cringe, you know what I mean? It was like we was on the estate and I was, I, I read it out, I was holding it on the paper. It was my cousin's fault, he kind of goaded me into it. He's like, no, trust me, she's gonna like it. It's really cringy, I don't know. I don't. But that's the first time I, I remember writing a poem, which was like consciously, consciously I wanted to write and I wanted to share it with someone. No, I didn't get her. I mean, that was the first of many attempts to get her. I never got her in the end. <laughs> So obviously I, I, hadn't, I hadn't perfected my craft then. Um. Yeah, I started writing when I was about seven. And I, only, I don't remember doing it. I don't remember like why I wanted to do it, but I remember um, being angry about what I was writing about. And it was about I wanted a cat and my dad didn't want a cat. So I rhymed cat and fat and insulted him. <laughs> I was like, a really good first rhyme. And then I just carried on. So I've got, I've got folders and folders and books of poems that I've written from the age of seven up until now. I don't know why, I just loved it. Every time I sort of read a book or thought of a new idea or spoke to someone about something, I just wanted to summarise it and the summary was always in a little poem for some reason, like everything. When I started writing, I think a big part of that was just about making friends. Like when I went to secondary school, I went from a school that was about 40 people, um, and you obviously knew every one of them, to a school that was about 800 and something, and I didn't know a single person there. So I think starting to, starting to write and to spend all of this time really carefully articulating and crafting these things, which basically like just um, sum up everything that you care about and believe most deeply. You're kind of just saying, right, this is who I am. I think it was a compulsion, to be honest. I mean, I loved, I, I grew up listening to a lot of folk music, um, a lot of rap music, music in general. I didn't really come from a, a literature-based family, but there was always a lot of music and I was always drawn to songwriting and, and to lyrics. So I think that kind of turned me on, but I didn't particularly know I was writing poetry until a lot later on. I didn't know really what poetry was. I didn't engage with it at school. I was just writing in a way that made sense to me as a 14-year-old kid. And also, the great thing with poetry is that you can hide a lot of your feelings and a lot of your truth in metaphor. And that's why I felt safe uh, doing that. You know, the more abstract the writing, um, the more surreal, the safer it became. It started as a way to kind of get over my loneliness in those classrooms and also as a way of learning English. So my mother would take us to the library um, every Saturday and we'd go there, we'd take like 10 books up because that was the maximum you could take out and we'd just read like that entire week and I would learn by just copying everything that I kind of like saw in those, in those books. So I was a reader and I still am a reader before I'm a writer in that sense. Right now, there is a kid finishing parents' evening in a heated discussion with his mother, saying, why does he have to study subjects he will never, ever use in his life? And she will look at him, blank-eyed, stifle a sigh, think for a second, and then lie. She'll say something along the lines of, you know, to get a good job, you need a good degree, and these subjects will help you get a good degree. We never had this opportunity when I was younger. And he will reply, but you were young a long time ago, weren't you, Mum? And she won't respond, although what he implies makes perfect sense, that society's needs would have changed since she was 16. There was a culture that was emerging at the time I was growing up, because I guess where my, my parents are second generation immigrants, so there was a lot of like us trying to balance being in London and trying to balance our um, African heritage, which they were trying to put on us and help us trying to understand. I guess I had the opportunity to appreciate and grow with a lot of different people, you know? And I think that really started to shape who I was as a person. I had an understanding that I wasn't an individual, but I was more part of a collective. We had a very kind of collective understanding. Our mentality wasn't the mentality of our parents. It was a collective of these, these people who've come from these backgrounds who were emerging it and we were creating this London inner city culture. And that was around the time the emergence of stuff, things like grime and all these kind of art forms. So it was a really great time to find an individual identity and an individual voice that I guess didn't exist so much in London 
before before this period in time. We all had different thought process experiences and genes. So why is a class full of individuals tested by the same means? So that means Sherelle thinks she's done because she couldn't do a couple of sums. And if this issue is not addressed properly, it then becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Then every school has the audacity to have a policy on equality, the irony. absolutely find that it's bigger than me. The writing is like bigger than me and the writing reaches out to other people. I've been sort of fighting these very negative portrayals for a very long time. I feel that I want to keep kind of pushing against these stereotypical views of me, of kind of the people that I come from, the country that I come from, just showing the humanity of, of kind of people. And with the poetry, I've always wanted to do that. People have said, you talk about like taboo subjects quite a lot. But I never really thought about it that way because they're not like, to me, they're not taboo. Like this, they're talking about sex. I talk about a lot, I guess, or, or <laughs> like, yeah, body after birth or pregnancy or that sort of thing. Like, that's all I talk about with my friends. So I guess maybe people aren't then putting up a poem about it on YouTube. But when people say to me they're taboos, it's like, everything, bad seems to come from taboos of not talking about stuff. If people were just a bit more open, maybe it would be more helpful. Just trying to work out what you have in common with lots of other people that you can say in relation to your experience and other people will, um, will, will care and it will resonate with them. I'm just searching for an angle. I'm just searching for a voice. I'm just searching for a way to fit in. I'm just searching for a reason to rejoice. And I am just trying to treat breathing as a choice and smiling as a must. I'm just mining for a diamond in the rough. I guess I'm just trying to find happiness. Yeah, pretty much. I'm just trying to be happy. I am just searching for a true fact, for one that I can really understand feels kind of like, like searching for a ruby in the dirt or for a church in the city of the damned. And really, I'm just trying to be a man, a good one. I guess I just wish I had a plan, a good one. Really, I'm just trying to be a, a good son. I'm just trying to be a good son. Young people do want to express, but I think that what is more important is to be able to validate young, the story of young people. That's what we don't do as a society. We don't make permissible uh, their experience. And I'm talking about cultural experience. What happens is, is that they feel if they are of a particular uh, ethnic minority or if they are of a particular sexual orientation, that their story is not going to be as legitimised or as worthy as the, as the privileged classes or the privileged group of people in a society. So part of my job is to go in there and to kind of introduce poetry as something that is for everyone, that is relevant, that is now, and that is incredibly necessary in being able to understand the times that we're living in and to understand the self. I'm just searching for things that are constant. I'm just searching for things that are real. I'm just trying to make sense of my problems, just trying to sum up the things that I feel, things I desire, things I believe in, trying to treat breathing as being intrinsically freeing and smiling as winning. Graciously, I'm just trying to keep grinning. Basically, I'm just searching for ways to express the bittersweet taste on my tongue and the similarly melancholy ache in my chest trying to not feel hate for the angel of death. I'm just searching for ways to impress, to astound my mum, my dad, or the friends that I've found. I'm just trying to make them proud. I'm just trying to make them proud. I'm just trying to make my peace with the hustle. Life is a battle, needless to grumble. I feel that the internet um, or social media platforms are super, super like necessary, um, just in terms of connection and connecting poets to each other, just like by finding them on YouTube. There's this kind of great thing where people share poems that have touched them, poems that have made them cry. Um, and it's great that we have that kind of space where we can share things. I just love the fact that even if you can't go to theatres or, like me, you're too intimidated to walk into a 
poetry venue or an open mic night. Like it took me two years of walking past the poetry cafe in London every Tuesday and didn't go in because I just thought, oh, it's so intimidating going in. But I just like the fact that you can sit from your home for free and watch things that you might not have the chance to, the money to, the transport to get there, the time, do you know what I mean? I think tech has the power to give young people a really democratic platform, getting their voices out there. YouTube was the first medium that really gave me an opportunity to reach people en masse. And the great thing about um, YouTube is that it captures moments, it captures whole moments, live as they happen, can deliver it to you. So I would encourage people to capture their moments and build the stories that the world needs to hear. You come undone. The body mocks you, betrays you, hurts you. A knot inside unwinds slowly. It is sometime towards the end of August and you are thinking of names for a baby girl or boy. You want to nurse it, fill up its empty body. When the knot finally came loose, your husband carried you to the toilet. He thought you were both drowning in your own bed. Pretend it to be jam spread over a loaf of bread. How to contain it all, put it back inside the body. This is the fourth time you lost control and there's no crying towards sleep or hours spent searching or your head resting against the toilet to begging it back. You just wished that your visions had touched first before the rope inside broke and you had to throw away the bed sheets. Um, I'm transitioning from poetry to music, not to say that I'm leaving poetry behind, I just want to incorporate the two and show the world how the whole music industry could be used as a platform to say constructive things, because we need somewhere to do it. Let's do that. What I'm doing is trying to present to you what I see in society and then trying to lead the conversation that that should provoke. That's my own undertaking. I don't have to do it like that. I could just use music to tell you things about myself, but that's not the primary aim. The primary aim is to try and share like all these things that seem obvious to me and to try and understand why they're not obvious to everyone else. And then to try and understand why the solutions that seem obvious to me aren't being implemented. I thought I was gonna do that through politics. When I understood how the system works, I thought I might have a little more flexibility through art, I'll definitely have more engagement. No, I don't need a party. No, I just never spent what I spent on this car, not to be seen. People never thought that I could make a poem, a song, but I've been figuring it out as I'm going along. And I'm young. Most of my man, them are older. She said she could tell, because I don't carry myself like I'm younger. I was like, AJ, hey, nothing but a number. Trust, my rage ain't nothing but my hunger. That's why I said, sorry, I went ghost this year. I had to make sure the coast was clear. Writing plans while the lads argue about things I'm not even supposed to hear. Then they start to argue about me, said the world ain't ready for my little brother G. G's up there with the stars and the moon. Why they only giving them eight bars on a tune? All of my people said it the same if I did 16 I would have dead it again so last night I ran it past God God said no that was never the aim to grind or die takes leadership I ain't out here on no eager tip this music thing it's a move to me we don't flip or ego trip cause I've been on the grind like all day all night more time I don't want to sleep I've been on the, I've been I respect on the, the audience a great deal and like not in a kind of sycophantic way but that's the thing that makes you absolutely buzz off it because somebody is talking to you You're watching somebody completely open up, but in a way that is all about you and you being here. Holly, especially, like, when she's on the mic doing her thing, telling her poems. What's wrong with kissing? Lips together, hands caressing skin. What's wrong with just touching? Bodies together, heat and breaths on our... Because I think we've gone too far now. Can we please stop and turn the clock a little back now? Because it seems we're slipping too damn slack now. Watching one type of porn instead of holding hands and rubbing each other's backs now. Thanks. Thank it's unbelievable, it's, un it's unreal. For this kind of, I don't know, new wave of poetry or whatever you'd call it, it's amazing, it's lush. People are coming to see poetry, that's <laughs> so exciting. My friend, my high woman, the vibe I'm from. 
on the synths at the back, the first one there is is Claire Uchiwa. But I think that there's this kind of weird intellectual like snobbery about that, it's, that the art is this holy thing that exists kind of in its own vacuum. I don't, I don't believe in that at all. I think the most important part of the performance is like what happens in the crowd. Because if it's powerful in the crowd, then it lives. It lives a minute beyond you getting off stage. It goes outside into the street, it lives in those people's heads all the way home. And that's the most powerful thing that a gathering of people to experience culture together can do. It can like explode outside the doors. You gotta take it as it comes, you gotta do what you gotta do. Until you get it done, gotta know what you're in it for. And don't stop till you got what you're living for. It's too much. Your hand did the mold and told fit into this. And then maybe one day you could really be big. Behind the scenes footage of the famous last gig. The backstage close up of the singer's last twitch. Before she pulls her gun out and she blows herself to bits. The world is your playground. Go and get your kicks. As long as you're not poor or ugly or sick. We never saw it coming like all the best tricks. Cause yes, once we had the fear, but now we have the fix. <laughs> Next revolution, the revolution of the mind. You can't ask the world to change unless you're not ready to change the way you're thinking about things.